Ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear director, dear uh, your excellencies, uh, uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, also in the online uh, sphere, it is my pleasure to be with you today, although uh, my voice actually preserves uh, the moment when uh, we actually scored twice against Germany. <laughs> so since then I was not able to recover because still living with this beautiful memory. I think uh, all of us saw what happened on, on Wednesday and um, it was a special moment, a special day, a special time. So I think uh, football is still, international football still can unite uh, nations and uh, can unite the whole Europe. So I do hope that uh, the, the outcome of this whole uh, football uh, European Championship uh, will have a lot of uh, lessons for all of us to learn and especially to be more united and more, di more diverse uh, in the future. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is also my pleasure to speak uh, at the summer university. I really like uh, uh, summer universities because at the same time you can have a very high intellectual conversation and uh, you can meet uh, participants from all over the world, but in a, in a leisure uh, circumstances and I, I really like loose and uh, everything, everybody is uh, uh, maybe a bit easier off, so uh, maybe it also opens up ways for a very honest uh, conversation. Um, I actually prepared the speech uh, to be uh, correctly in time, uh, but first of all, I would like to also congratulate to the organizers. And although this is my first time in Kursag in my capacity as Minister of uh, Justice, but of course, uh, during my high school years, I visited uh, uh, the castle and I was here in 2012, the summer when we had the transit festival. Also that time my second uh, baby was a newborn baby, so I have nice, uh, uh, memories uh, linked to this city. And uh, thank you very much, Madam Ambassador, to uh, invite me uh, or to propagate me yes. to be invited. She's uh, our ambassador this, this, this time. Yeah. So I see uh, UNESCO everywhere. Uh, this place deserves uh, UNESCO titles as well, so um, I'm happy to be uh, with you. And we are uh, talking about Central Europe uh, while I was uh, driving here. I was thinking about whether there is any kind of uh, word or synonym or, or a joke or something which could just uh, uh, function as a, as a bon mot for the Visegrad countries. And I just recalled my memories from Brussels when we were sitting uh, with all Central European colleagues in a pub while our kids were swimming. Uh, and we could watch them through the glasses. And uh, I think what all links us together that we are sitting at a table and some of us just s stands up and uh, silent just settles the whole bill for the whole table. And, uh, and this, is, uh, this is like this every day. We are inviting everyone, we are so welcoming, and uh, we know that the second week it's something else or somebody else will be settling the, the bill, but no, no fuss around uh, who is actually uh, paying for who. And uh, this also links us together also with the Western Balkan, let's say. We were all sitting there, former Yugoslavian, emigrant uh, living in Brussels, and we really knew each other from half sentences. And I think the Kritek, or the Kishvakond in Hungarian, which is a, a cartoon, uh, which uh, still today is a living uh, story, a living uh, tale for our kids, because I, I had my colleagues uh, of the same age. But while in Western Europe you have the um, uh, bande dessinée, or you have these uh, Asterix and Obelix, uh, we have Kritek, we have Kishvakond uh, in Central Europe, and this also connects me, connects us still uh, today together. And I think uh, we are talking about values and traditions uh, uh, nowadays, especially in connection with the, with the online threat, uh, because uh, at the same time, online uh, uh, technologies helps our life. Uh, uh, to be connected easier, especially during the pandemic. This is a, it's a great lesson to learn how easily we could switch in many, many procedural uh, issues to the online functioning, but still we cannot uh, get rid of physical presence. And we all were very happy and enthusiastic about uh, that after we just uh, torn down the third wave of the pandemic, we were able to meet in person again. And um, we will uh, also focus, uh, especially in the Minister of Justice, uh, on the work of the Digital Freedom Committee, which is there to tackle the greatest challenge of our lives uh, today in the 21st century, uh, meaning that uh, how, to, how to see 
steal the truth uh, uh, in the in the world because there are so much information around us and uh, there are much room for misinterpret misinterpretation, much room for uh, for false information. So I always advise and recommend for not only for our audience but for for everyone uh, when we are tackling this issue that. Uh, uh, we should not uh, let us uh, uh, left uh, not to uh, see the, the truth. And for that, we, we need to have physical uh, friendships, we need to have uh, real encounters, we need to have summer universities. So, ladies and gentlemen, about the V4 and about Central European uh, countries, uh, I would like to start uh, by the Hungarians. Uh, for us, uh, you may know cultural identity is especially important for us. And even more so during these times when, especially um, in the online uh, uh, multicultural uh, chaos. So we think that cultural, social, and constitutional identities under, are under a continuous scrutiny by various multilateral and supranational organizations. As Geza Otlik, it's very special to talk about him because he's a famous uh, writer who wrote the masterpiece, uh, School at the Frontier. And uh, this novel has a very meaningful sentence. I hope the translation is, uh, um, is correct, but uh, later on I can also tell it in Hungarian. But just as the mate threat, you know, when chess in, in the chess you give mate at the end, this is the point. So just as the May threat cannot be defended by overturning the chessboard, so when you are just upset and you just overturn the chessboard, nor can the heavy cannons of truth be dragged into fragile structures such as human societies. This was a, a very uh, famous and important sentence uh, from, this, uh, from this masterpiece. And we Hungarians are not only proud of our own traditions, but also on our central European identity. And then once Prime Minister Orban was asked uh, whether he is European or not, he said, I am Hungarian, and this is why I can be European. If I were not Hungarian or Central European, I could not be European either. And I think in this very simple sentence, there is this very simple logic that uh, because Europe uh, was uh, established based on the strong alliance of uh, strong member states, it can only survive if it still remains with this very colorful uh, ally very colorful uh, alliance of strong member states and, uh, and not a, a sort of multicultural company or a multinational company which is directed from above, from a supranational body. So this, uh, this is key for us when we are talking about uh, uh, Central Europe. And we are convinced that our region, VLAN, should have a special role also in the future of the European Union. We all know that this debate has just started uh, at the end of May. Uh, Prime Minister gave his opening remarks on the 19th, last uh, Saturday. Uh, there were heavy messages, I know, and all of us uh, read it. And also, it was circulated in the international sphere. But uh, behind every sentence, behind every Hungarian point, as a recommendation for this future of the Europe uh, Conference, we have a strong experience. We have our first-hand experience, what we actually lived uh, not only as a member of the, uh, this European integration since 2004, but also as true Europeans who throughout the centuries defended European borders and also enriched the culture uh, of the whole European continent uh, with our talent and blood throughout the centuries. So um, we think that uh, Europe is at crossroads today because uh, we either redefine the future of the integration or we will let it fall victim to the run of wrong political decisions and political BS. Uh, I myself, I had been working in the European Parliament uh, between 2009 and 2018. And I'm very lucky because this was a very precious, precious time uh, how we newcomers and uh, members of uh, the Central European uh, uh, region uh, actually grew up or learned, uh, Western countries like to say this, you have to grow up, you are young democracy and there are old democracies. I always refuse this. But if you use this kind of dichotomy that old and new and young and old, uh, I think uh, just between 2009 and 18, what I uh, saw uh, on the level of uh, detailed everyday life dossiers, be it CO2 emissions of uh, 
big heavy plants uh, or industrial uh, dossiers whatsoever. I all felt uh, that um, maybe uh, the reality is not what we actually uh, saw on the drawing table before we joined the European Union. Because at the end of the day, mathematics has to work. And uh, if we are all honest to ourselves that Hungary is first, Germany is first, France is first, then we can be also honest to each other. And uh, since Hungarians, they got rid of the chains of uh, communism and, and, and also the, the language of that era, which did not let uh, citizens to speak their mind, we don't want to enter another world where you are not allowed to speak your mind either because there is this political correctness. I just call it or called it new speak because I think it's much better to sit at the table showing our cards that, look, uh, I made the mathematics in this dossier. I need, I need this and this is my red line. Otherwise, my economy will go bankrupt, etc. Otherwise, my industry, otherwise my SMEs, they won't get what they really deserve to get in order to have a fair share or a fair play. Uh, if we are not honest towards each other and towards our partners, then the whole cooperation, the whole integration may go wrong. And uh, this is uh, what I realized when I was working there, and I'm happy that uh, with the Central European region we have a completely different tone, because we like the language of, of honesty. We like to say that, sorry, but uh, we need to, to uh, come together to put together our mathematics the V4 countries plus. There, was, there has always been V4 plus cooperation uh, methodologies. Uh, not to mention, for example, the, the climate uh, uh, battle. Uh, we have a different uh, background with the collapse of our industry in Central Europe. We actually have the European Union to lead the way in, European, in, in international climate uh, uh, discussions because uh, there was a big, big reduction thanks to the collapse of our industries, but we paid the price because we paid the price in, in a social and economic crisis uh, for that. Uh, so it's not just hot air, as it was said, but um, it was a very good proof that we speak the same language in Central Europe, and if we uh, can always have our common lines, and we start together early at, at, at the beginning of each and every dossier, uh, then we have... Uh, a greater chance for the success. Of course, uh, there is no uh, one-size-fits-all solution for each and every country in Central Europe. We are very diverse. Uh, what, what is special to us, we are very diverse from uh, Western Europe, but at the same time, when it comes to the comparison, as I said at the beginning, uh, we know each other from half sentences. And especially we know our, our specificities. We, uh, we know what is the difference uh, between uh, Croatian history and Hungarian history. We know what is the difference uh, in, in the regional uh, sensitivities as well. Uh, and we are, we are really taking a great care of, of this kind of sensitivity. And sometimes we are just, you know, managed in, in big groups like all oh, these former countries, all oh, these former ex-socialist countries, etc., etc. And uh, I think... Uh, now in Europe, if, if we don't, uh, uh, how to say, make uh, our Western partners to learn our history, to learn our specificity, specificities, and, and to learn uh, also about uh, our uh, historic uh, background and also the constitutional development, how we get uh, uh, to, to the present, where we are today, uh, they will not be able to, to understand us at all. And uh, I think we also have this kind of failure, and I'm very honest uh, towards uh, us. Uh, no one today looks uh, further uh, to the east from the point where he or she uh, stands at the moment. If uh, I just uh, remember what I learned in school, we were all, you know, learning uh, French and always has an aspirational uh, direction towards the West. Go West, go West, and learn a lot about their histories. That's why when I ended up in Brussels, I knew a lot about Belgian history. Also at the law school, we learned so much about constitutions of the West. But no one learns about constitutions uh, in the East or in Central Europe. And this is why we have to make this work now. Uh, we have a professoral network. Uh, this is a, a scholarship program, and it is uh, it has uh, the aim to, to make this uh, gap uh, filled in, filled up uh, with a lot of uh, scientific research 
to show the world, to show Europe who we are, what is uh, the development uh, model uh, of constitutions in Central Europe, because we need to uh, also have this know-how uh, to show our partners, because this is still missing. And uh, when I also talk uh, in uh, rule of law debates, and we have this kind of criticism that, oh, you are new democracies, that you don't know too much uh, about rule of law. I said that just after seven years, after Magna Carta was created, you know, 1215 is Magna Carta, 1222 is the golden bull, uh, which is actually uh, the, the basic uh, constitutional deed when it comes to limit power, when it comes to limit public power, irrespective of the fact that the, the straight structure was, of course, completely different. But when it comes to uh, make official limits and restrictions uh, to public life and to, to power and to authority, it already started in Hungary in the 13th uh, century. So uh, when it comes to the question uh, where Europe should uh, go, uh, I would like to remind everyone what uh, made Brexit happen. If you remember, uh, Prime Minister Cameron, Cameron said once that if we win the, the vote, we will make every effort to delete uh, from the treaty the ever closer union concept, which we actually they never sign up to. And uh, the pragmatic translation to this ever closer union concept uh, uh, for me uh, was my professional experience in the EU when, whenever there was a crisis, uh, be it financial, uh, be it a migration crisis or COVID crisis. Uh, the, the pattern, the, the model, the answer was always more Europe. So more Europe uh, helps uh, some politicians to, um, to hide away the truth, to hide away our deficiencies. And uh, I just uh, could not you know, bear it when I was uh, experiencing it uh, from very closely, because we see concrete problems and failures. Uh, just uh, let's mention the, the common uh, purchase of vaccines. It was very slow. There were a lot of chaos when it comes to the rules and regulations. And uh, member states daily had problems. But uh, you saw never uh, the lessons learned that ah, we should do it better next time or we should focus on what strong member states did. Instead, we got a lot of criticism uh, while uh, Hungarians, uh, because at the same time, being completely pro-European, we signed up to the common framework for purchasing vaccines. But it was also allowed, according to European rules, to ask for other uh, sources. Because I think uh, the primary responders, the primary responsible responders were uh, the governments. Who else could have been during a pandemic? Governments are there uh, to safeguard and protect uh, lives, health, and, and, uh, and property. And, uh, and to control economic damages. And for that, you need uh, to give enough room for member states to act. This, do this does not exclude uh, the ability and uh, the, the willingness to act together. But uh, here in this um, uh, very good recent example, I think you all know what I'm, I'm talking about. Because uh, we need Europe where it is necessarily uh, uh, the only uh, possibility to have a European solution. But we need everywhere uh, member states action where it is possible. And uh, if we are talking about climate change, uh, fighting climate change or environmental issues or uh, economic cooperation, we need more Europe, of course, because this is how we can uh, make these four freedoms uh, working. But when it comes to uh, uh, subsidiarity principle, when it comes to uh, readiness to act swiftly, uh, rationally, uh, then there are the member states, the first, first responders. And also, when it comes, for example, to the migratory challenge of, of today, um, here again, uh, you, there are some aspects which are practical, pragmatical, how to make common efforts to protect uh, borders, how to make uh, rules uh, standardized and harmonized. But when it comes to ideological approach towards migration, and there cannot be more Europe, because we are so different. We are uh, coming from different uh, 
cultural background, we have different <coughs> historical uh, experience with migration. So there must be tolerance instead of, uh, of um, centrally forced uh, migratory rules. Mm. And uh, we think that uh, cooperation between the uh, V4 countries is a very good uh, example for all this. If you look at what happened during the pandemic, during uh, uh, what happened uh, in the migration uh, crisis, uh, these countries, and also with uh, countries coming from the Central uh, European region, not namely V4, but all linked to us, we always had a good cooperation with Croatia, with Slovenia, uh, with uh, all our uh, uh, like-minded countries in many crucial questions. Then we were uh, successful uh, at the end because we started together and uh, we set our red lines uh, uh, together. So I think uh, this also drives us to the, to the competitiveness issue because uh, as also Prime Minister said, I think last year in BLED there was a forum, V4 uh, and then Central European Forum, uh, for uh, the economic uh, forecast of Europe. And he said that if member states are not strong economically, how can we talk about a strong European integration? And uh, this also means that uh, a union that respects identity, competencies and successful economic and social models. And we strive for redefining the future of our integration with these words. We want to preserve the freedom which we refer to as a national sovereignty at the level of nations and individual freedom at the level of individuals. And uh, we were in uh, Porto last, uh, oh, two, two months ago, in uh, early May. It was a social summit. I think it is also a very, very uh, emblematic example how uh, there is a, a looming enlargement of competences but at the same time, there are very, very good and functioning, uh, feasible national models. And the very reason why we also were there, we wanted to, you know, propagate or not propagate, to advertise uh, the Hungarian model. Because now we really have the facts and we have evidences that it can work, it, fun it can function. What is the common European goal? To be competitive. Uh, to um, have a good GDP ratio, uh, uh, economic growth, to have a low level of uh, unemployment uh, in the country, uh, and to have a social policy which actually guarantees the constant uh, and stable rise in the, in the income uh, and the salaries. And while there is a European solution, which we uh, um, in principle are not against, but when it comes to pragmatic uh, uh, steps, we refer to subsidiarity because it is in the treaty that social pillar is not a harmonized uh, pillar in the European integration. Our goal is uh, common, but let us choose our own economic policy mix. Like uh, in the energy policy, we have the, uh, we already fought for the right to have our own economic or energy policy mix. It means that, uh, uh, for example, nuclear energy uh, has also uh, a green light, especially in the Union, because we have the target. We have to achieve CO2 reduction, we have to achieve renewable targets, but the way how we make this mixture uh, workable, it must be left to the Member States. Because if you look at uh, our region, we have a big heritage of the, of the former uh, Soviet era uh, with all the gas supply and energy supply. We need to catch up with uh, interconnectors. Uh, we are not living in the, in the Switzerland where there are mountains everywhere, uh, water is pouring down from the mountains and we are so easily interconnectable. Uh, we are here in Central Europe where we must be linked uh, together with pipelines, uh, with uh, Vice versa uh, direct, uh, direction pipelines, which, which needs a lot of time to be built uh, uh, and also uh, needs a lot of uh, uh, foreign affairs uh, policy uh, and, uh, and good cooperation between, between big nations. And not to mention that 80% uh, of the gas supply is still coming through one pipeline from Russia. So this is a reality. And when I was sitting in energy, um, 
energy summits when I was an advisor to energy policy and, and uh, environment policy. I was, you know, just silently laughing when somebody from the Switzerland actually presented the big energy package back in 2014 or, or 16, that how good it is and uh, now everybody from tomorrow on must follow these principles. How can we geographically and also with this uh, historical uh, industrial burden on us, not to mention our Pol Polish friends where still uh, the, the coal is a, a very uh, dominant uh, fuel. And it is not about the goodwill, how we, we could be greener and, and more uh, interconnected, but it is about uh, realities. And uh, that's why we fought for uh, the right to have our own economic policy mix. And this is working. And uh, the same uh, coming back to the Porto summit with the social pillar, because uh, the Hungarian model is, is based on the respect for for job. Those who want to work in this country, uh, the government has the responsibility to provide this uh, person with a job. And once he or she has the job, we have to guarantee that the most part of the income remains with this working uh, person. And plus, en plus, if he or she still have a family, or raises children, the more children he or she raises, the more money should be left with the family. This is a complete switch from the economic policy what we had in Hungary uh, before 2010. Uh, and this is all based on the merit uh, of the work and the respect for work. And this shift was not so easy to make because we had to have a lot of conflict uh, with Brussels, for example, uh, when it comes to the public uh, working scheme. Uh, but uh, over time it proved to be working. And although we still have some uh, um, discrepancies with, uh, with the Brussels administration, Numbers are there, and numbers are outnumbering criticism. Uh, we actually managed to double the, the basic salary, the basic uh, income of uh, Hungarian households, not to mention the family policy, because we do think that the family is the enabling uh, environment for someone to work in this country. And this is our economic policy mix, uh, how to achieve the constant increase of salaries. Family policy, identity policy, because we do believe in our, our families, in our uh, force uh, in the nation. We actually detect each and every group of the society who are not still engaged with the labor market, and we help them to be engaged sustainably and actively. And we also have uh, uh, the economic policy, where we all uh, try to uh, promote uh, Hungarian uh, industries, Hungarian SMEs, uh, Hungarian businesses. So these are the pillars which then, you know, add up or come, come together to the, to the results, uh, what, what we achieved. So uh, I don't know how much time do I have. I think um, well, here I, I can also start. We have a an, 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 uh, follow-up discussion, a panel. I think all of these very important ideas which you have um, you, you just um, presented um, can be discussed further. But we start a little later, so you just go on if you... Um, actually, because I, I prepared the speech, but uh, I think it's better to, to talk uh, freely uh, no, together. <laughs> because it, it's not like uh, a big room full of uh, people sitting like this and no, 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 giving... No, no, not. Yes. 75 people are with us. No, 80, yes. 80, 80, sorry, plus. So, uh, so we are talking to them too. And um, the, just uh, closing remarks, then uh, I can, I can um, end up here. Uh, that uh, we think that uh, in the Central European region, if you look at the numbers, if you look at the population, uh, how many millions are we together, if you look at the GDP growth, especially after the pandemic, uh, there's a lot of uh, energy here, vitality. And um, there's a lot uh, uh, in this pure statistical data. Uh, if people were asked uh, whether you see the future as a prosperous one, a positive one, uh, the answer was, uh, uh, overwhelmingly positive in this part of Europe, uh, contrary to, to the western part of Europe. Although we still have a lot to do, because our living standards are not yet there, uh, especially I'm coming from a region from Borsod, which is among the 20 least developed regions of Europe. But if you ask people about Europe, about Europeanship, about uh, future prospects, they are all so positive. 
So we have this kind of uh, living energy. And uh, we just uh, would like to uh, ask from our Western partners, who we like a lot, uh, to have this honesty in cooperation. If, uh, if a measure is called uh, social welfare measure in France, but at the same time, with the same content, it is called uh, protection uh, and uh, mm, uh, national economic protective measure uh, in the West, we are still talking about the same potato. Uh, so uh, just take us as we are. We don't want to learn the new speak. If we want to name it uh, as it is, and uh, this is how we sit at the negotiating table in Brussels. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for the. <laughs>